back at that time, Blue Rock Springs, that was a more or less a rural area. It had, uh, Vallejo had not expanded its city limits out that far yet, so it was, it was a rather rural area. On the weekends especially, there would be large crowds of people out there. They'd barbecue. And at night, it really got dark. There were some street lights out there, but only a couple of them. It, it was kind of out in the boondocks. And uh, p kids would use it parentally as a, as a, a lover's lane. Uh, you could drive your patrol car by there, and there'd be four or five cars out there many times. Of people listening to the radio and doing whatever else they do in lover's lane. It was July 4th, a holiday, and uh, my partner, I, John Lynch, who was also a detective sergeant, he was the, the senior of our team, uh, we worked uh, a late shift, like 3 to midnight, something like that, and uh, we were driving around. I was driving the, uh, you know, plainclothes car. We were, you know, plainclothes detectives, and we were down, I, th I, th I think, down around the downtown area in Vallejo, the old, old part of town, and uh, it was close to midnight, and we heard uh, reports of a possible shooting at Blue Rock Springs Park come over the radio. They dispatched a, a patrol car, and so I, I said, you know, I'm, I'm the younger by far of the, the two of us. Uh, so I told John, I said, well, why don't we, you want to head out there? And he says, no, nah, it's probably just firecrackers or something. At 12.10, the first call. Um, I received was from a young uh, white woman, I would say in her late teens, uh, 17, 16, 17, 18, somewhere around there. And she was really uh, ag agitated, excited, or whatever. And she reported that uh, there were kids being shot at at Blue Rock Springs. So since I was driving, I kind of started meandering that direction. And a few minutes later, we got, uh, I think, an, I, I believe another report of shots fired in, in, again at Blue Rock Springs. And uh, the officer, I think it was Dick Hoffman, a uh, patrol officer, got there first and said he had a shooting, two people involved. So then, obviously, I put it in high gear and took off, and we got out there pretty quickly. I was working uh, as a patrol officer in the uh, juvenile division. That was a plainclothes assignment. Now, I had just been out to Blue Rock Springs a half hour or so before that and uh, checked the area and found it closed. Uh, my purpose out there was uh, to make sure there no teenagers hanging out, uh, drinking, fighting, whatever. The park was closed. And there was no activity out there when I passed through a half hour or so ahead of uh, that time. So I, I took the call and I gave it to the dispatcher. And I remember her saying, I don't know who I'm going to send. I don't have anybody free. And I wasn't far away, so I turned around and went back out there, told dispatch that I was, I was going to go out there to check on that report. Hoffman was at the scene. We pulled in the parking lot, and I saw this uh, little, I think it was a 1963 light brown Corvair. It had its headlights on. The passenger door was open, and there was a male person laying on the ground. And Hoffman was ministering to him. And I got up close, and with my flashlight, I looked down there, and there was a uh, young guy down there uh, laying on his back. Obviously, had been shot. He was reaching up towards me or the flashlight I was holding, uh, kind of gurgling, obviously in pain. From him, I looked over in the front seat of the car and uh, saw uh, a young girl sitting behind the steering wheel of the car. She had been shot too. Blood all over the front in, in the car. And I asked Hoffman what you got here, and he says, I've got two, the driver in there, the girl, she's, she's uh, been shot. And this, this guy later identified as Michael Michelle was laying on the ground, and he, he, he'd just been shot to pieces. He had a bullet, I think, went through his neck and came out of his cheek. I got up and walked around to the driver's door, and the window was down, and uh, the girl later identified as Darlene Farron 
she had her eyes, you know, slitted open a little bit, and I could see she was breathing, and I asked her if she could tell me what happened. And she, she kind of tried mumbling something. I got up real close, and I, I, I never could distinguish any actual words. I checked her pulse, the carotid artery pulse. I found nothing. Uh, ambulance came. They loaded Majot up first and then got Darlene out of the car. And uh, one of the things I, I did when uh, they lifted Majot up, I, I, you know, we had marked, uh, I think Hoffman had outlined his body with a crayon. And so I was shining the light down there for whatever reason. I saw there was a bullet slug underneath where Majot had been lying. And I, I picked it up and it looked like a nine, nine millimeter parabellum bullet, they call it. I thought it kind of strange uh, when they undressed that man. He was wearing a lot of clothes. He had several pairs of pants on and some sweaters and long sleeve shirt. And that weather was hot that night out there. I, he was, I don't know why he was dressed so hot. I was real skinny, I was still skinny, but back in 1969, I was so skinny that I had to wear three pairs of pants, so I was so thin, uh, you know. To, uh, I wore three pairs of pants to cover up my thinness, and she knew it, but uh, she used to joke about it. She said, why are you wearing so many pants that I'm thin, you know? I found Darlene's purse in the back seat and got her identification out and her blood all over the seat. And then I walked around and Majot's wallet was up on, I think, the right rear fender of the car. And I later learned that Hoffman had gotten it out and had laid it up there. So I took that and the purse and those things were all put into evidence. When the ambulance left, we uh, told Hoffman to ride in the ambulance and keep trying to get a statement. Both of them uh, were put in the ambulance and I rode the ambulance with them to Kaiser Hospital in Vallejo. Did you try talking to her? There's no talking to her. Uh, I was there to record anything that would have been said, but I couldn't speak with her. She was, she was, uh, there was a uh, ambulance attendant's attendant giving her CPR during the ride to the hospital. And of course her shirt or sweater, whatever she was wearing was off. And each time that ambulance attendant blew air into her chest, there was a little piece of material from her bra that I could see fluttered with every breath he blew in, into that girl, the, the, this piece of material would flutter on the side. I could see that. There was no talking to that girl. You knew her before the attack, right? I never laid eyes on her. You never laid eyes on her before the attack? No, no. I'd heard that she was a waitress at uh, an all-night restaurant uh, in Vallejo, but I, I, I didn't know the girl at all. Gray Smith wrote a book about the Zodiac, and he, he mentioned in his book that I was at her, Darlene, and her husband's house on a house painting party prior to her death, and I, I don't know anything about that. It wasn't me. But that's what he says in his book. Darlene was my girlfriend and, uh, at the time, and uh, I was dating her, and uh, we were planning to get married. She was already married, and... Uh, Everybody knew her husband worked at the restaurant as a cook. His name was Steve. Uh, Steve was a really nice guy, a good friend of mine, but he knew that she, we were dating, but uh, she also dated my twin brother, Steve. My identical twin brother, Steve, she also dated him. And Steve, we had a big fight, me and Steve had a big fight about that. Because I pretended like I was Warren Beatty, the actor. And I told her, I said, I'm Warren Beatty, the actor, and uh, this is my brother, he just shot somebody. And she said, oh, that's cool, I'll take care of you guys. She did say that. Now, I thought, I told Steve, how about that? Yeah. So she, uh, made a long story short, she, uh, it was sort of was a joking thing, but it's too bad she ended up losing her life behind it. You know, seriously, it's too bad she got murdered as a result of uh, our meeting. And I went to my house, and she picked me up at my house, and uh, we were going to go out that night. She, we couldn't see each other the next day, so we decided to see each other that night, after, after, after midnight, after midnight to have a lover's lane type thing, kiss and talk and hold each other's hands. Is that what Blue Rock Springs was usually? Yeah, it was the lover's lane park for young people. I was 19 at the time, now I'm 57, but I was 19 at the time.
She was 22. We were chased by this guy, chased by him from a restaurant. He was chasing us, and I told her to pull off of the park, and we chased me all night long at the restaurant, chased us to a, a coffee shop named Paul's, or whatever it was called, and then, uh, then he chased us all the way to the park, and then we, that's where we ended up in Blue Ox Springs Park. I thought he drove off, drove away, but he came back later on and shot us. Michael Majo, uh was the only one that was a of the two that was able to talk to us at all, and he he gave a, a, a just a very brief description. He thought, I believe he told Hoffman he thought it was a car like Darlene. Dar, it was Darlene Farron's car, the Corvair, and he said he thought uh, a car pulled up a few feet away from them just you know a couple of minutes before the shooting. He's not wasn't sure if it was the same car. It was like a brown Renault car, small combat car, small combat car. But it could have been a Cadillac, too. I'm not really sure. Uh, I can't really remember. He said his car pulled up, and uh, he asked Darlene, do you know who that is? And she said something like, never mind. She told him he was a friend of hers not to worry about it. He was just jealous. That's all she said about him. He was just jealous. She never mentioned his name, but she said, tell him about Richard. I was like, oh, his name was Richard. I remember his name Richard. And I think that was his name. She referred to him as Richard, the Zodiac killer guy. And she said, he really had a mean temper, and that if he ever found out, he would kill her. He would kill her. As she mentioned, she said the words, he would kill me if he ever knew I was talking to you about that. She told me that. And then the car left, and then just very shortly after that, this car pulled up behind their car with the headlights on, and he he thinks it might have been the same car, but he couldn't he didn't see the car to be able to tell. I told her we were on the run. We were literally on the run, literally on the run. This guy was chasing us big time. I don't think you told the police that night that they that you'd been chased, though. No, I didn't. I didn't. I left that out. I don't know why, but I, left that out. I forgot about it or something. But you're sure now that you... But I'm sure that it happened, yeah. I'm not sure if he told Hoffman before we got there that uh, when he was shot, uh, that he, he was able to get out of the car and fell down on the ground, and as he lay on the ground, he saw this, the uh, assailant's car drive away toward back toward the city of Vallejo at a high rate of speed. He drove off quietly. He didn't feel like he drove real quietly. And his car and quietly drove out. You could barely hear the engine he drove out. I believe he said that it looked like it might have been that same car that pulled up, you know, next to them just a few minutes before the actual shooting, but I, I can't be positive about that. We thought he just left and he wasn't going to bother us anymore, but he came back and got out of his car. He had a blinding light. He had a big uh, beamer just blinding my eyes, like right in my eyes. I thought it was a police with a flashlight, but it wasn't a police, it was him. There's a killer. You know, I thought it was a policeman. That's why I, I didn't, I wrote it in the window. I wrote, I wrote, I wrote it in the window. So, because I was so, so I could have my ID. And that's, that's when he started shooting. And I thought he hit me, but I looked down, I saw blood spurting out of my mouth. I knew he, I had been shot. I, I, I was asking the policeman, why'd you hit me? You know, and I realized I had been shot, it wasn't a policeman. That's the first time I realized it wasn't a policeman, it was a killer. I, I got shot five times. Shot in the face, went through my right, into my right ear, went through my tongue and my jaw and came out here and went into her. A bullet went into her and killed her. And uh, shoulder, elbow, my side, and twice my left leg. It lasted a long time because he, he shot me and shot me and shot me and shot me and shot me. It took forever, man, for me. I, I might have been a silencer. Might have had a silencer, but I don't know. Just, I didn't really hear a, 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 lot, a big bang like a gun, nine minutes of a make, but I heard a snapping sound like a firecracker. So I think he, to me, I thought he had a silencer because I didn't hear a, I, mean, I could hear her, you know, but, I, but it wasn't a loud, booming bang. It was just uh, it was like a pop, like and a crack, you know, like pow, 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 crack, crack, crack. That's what a shot sounded like, crack, like, like a firecracker gun or a BB gun, you know. 
When we got there, the headlights and taillights were on, and I believe the radio, the ignition was turned to the accessory position, and the, the radio was on and playing low. I, I did later learn that uh, uh, Michael thinks that Darlene flashed the lights on and off the headlights trying to attract attention. Uh, he says he's not sure if he asked her to do that or if she did it on her own, but that, because uh, he said when they, uh, Michael uh, told me later that when they first, they pulled into the parking lot, she turned the lights off but had the radio on. And uh, apparently if she was flashing the lights for attention, she ended up leaving the headlights on because they were on on when we got there. But Michael, Michael told me that uh, when they pulled in, she turned the headlights off. When he came up and shot me, I did have an idea what he looked like. He looked like a tall white guy, about six feet tall, jet black hair, curly hair, and he uh, <clears throat> he looked like an average looking person, but he wasn't ugly, he wasn't handsome, just an average nondescript guy, you know, a like plain guy, you know, but he had a dark, tall, dark, and he may have worn glasses like yours or my, mine, you know, or reading glasses. You know, he may have even had glasses. I recall he did have glasses on, as I recall. He did have glasses. I remember that. He definitely had glasses on. The gun top flew in the back seat of the car. I was upside down. My left leg was around my shoulder. My arm was around. I was taking myself with my own arm. I opened the back door to get out, and I fell out of the ground. And she, was already, she was already dead. So how long was it before the police showed up? Uh, about nine hours. Literally, the time I was shot, I was, I was in the blood for like four hours. I, I was on the ground for four hours. July 4, 1969, everybody was having fun and games. And I, I, people came by and saw me there, wouldn't even call the cops. And I was there for four hours. People were like, are you all right, Mr. Rice? No, I'm not all right. You know? and they, they, said, this run, they ran screaming. You know? but yeah, it was a horrible night for me. <clears throat> it was. Because when she died, you know, it wasn't just me, it was she, I knew she was dead. Well, I was going to marry her, you know, I was really going to marry her, so I took it really hard that she died. Because I felt like I should have saved her, you know, because I was there to protect her, and I couldn't protect her. I always regret the fact that she got killed. I was still partly responsible for it, you know. Physically, I'm fine. No, physically, I'm fine. I feel I'm fine, but mentally, the scars, are, emotionally, the scars are still there. I feel really good if you lose Scott. I feel really good. Put an end to that. Put that guy in death, death row or something. It just made me feel closure or that. I feel better because they, they solved the, the murder case against Darlene, who is a nice, innocent, good person, the innocent victim of circumstance. You know, she, people put her down and say she was a whore or whatever. She wasn't. She was a very nice human being, and I did love her, and I still love her. I always love her, you know. And she, she got murdered needlessly. She was 22 years old. I was 19. But I lived. I lived long good life after after that shooting but uh, she got killed that day and I can't forget that there's a black, black black mark on my life I like to get closer for her case and her family who suffered never knowing who who murdered their daughter Darlene Perrin I, I think I could see the color she had blue eyes their eyes were you know partially opened but uh uh, she, and she, I could tell she was breathing, and she, you know, she responded to me when I asked her, "Can you tell me what happened?" She was trying to say something, but she was just uh, so gone at that time that just, uh, well, I, I got my ear right up next to her mouth, and I, you know, just nothing. I couldn't make anything out. After the shooting at Blue Ox Springs Park, the Zodiac, the, the shooter, apparently drove back into Vallejo and drove down. A uh, street called Tuolumne Street, and there's a you know, there, at that time there was a Union 76 gas station that was closed at the time. Uh, there's a public phone booth there, and he called the Vallejo Police Department and claimed uh, responsibility. Then the next call I got 
was about 1240. And that's the call that I received, received from the man who was uh, subsequently called Zodiac. He spoke in a monotone. It's like he had rehearsed it or was reading what he was saying. He had a very non-emotional voice. You know, his first words were, I want to report a double murder. If you'll go one mile east on Columbus Parkway to the public park. And I said, yes, sir, we have a report of a shooting in that area. Uh, I still need to get your name and your location. And he said, uh, you'll find the kids in a brown car. They were shot with a nine millimeter Luger. And I also killed those kids last year. I got a very taunting, uh, scary type, creepy feeling from from the call. And when he got to the end of his statement, uh, it's hard for me to duplicate, but instead of just saying, if you read my report, it means nothing. But if you hear, you know, if you could have heard, I can't explain it as well as I still hear it. Uh, you know, it was it was from somebody who was really out there, but his uh, his voice really changed when he came to goodbye, and it wasn't just goodbye. Now it may sound a little silly to people. It didn't to me at the time, but he he said something like goodbye, and he hangs up. And I'm just kind of sitting there thinking, oh my God. 